Welcome to another episode, the 40th episode of Silver Lining for Learning. And the last episode in 2020. And also it's an episode that unfortunately won't be able to see Chris. Uh, uh, Chris did, it will be only through voice. And uh, so what we would like to do today is really reflection about the whole uh, silver lining for learning before we get started. And what happened in this year is amazing. It hasn't ended, has not, you know, we have vaccinations. And there's, we've seen a lot of innovations. We've seen a lot of changes. We've seen a lot of individuals, a lot of groups uh, doing amazing things. I just hope that um, everyone who is watching us can learn something from that. And so since Punia was so excited about this show, I will let Punia go first to talk about what he wants to share with us. No, no, I just wanted to say two very simple things. Thanks, Zhao. So first of all, I uh, want to thank Zhao for kicking this off. And um, that email that came 45 weeks ago, 43 weeks ago, I don't know, um, where he said, what if this pandemic went on for a year? And I remember sort of being skeptical of that, uh, like, oh, no way, this thing is going to go on for a year. Um, but here we are. So for your sense of looking to the future, uh, though I wish that you had not thought that, maybe you'd have, if you'd have thought like, if this lasts for six months and maybe you would be done by now, so I can blame you for it partly. Um, so that's one. And the other thing is this, the ultimate irony of this being 2020, because 2020 is usually when we say hindsight is 2020. And I think this is going to be one of those years where even in hindsight, it is going to be difficult to make sense of it. Or maybe in hindsight, we will make sense of it in the sense that, and that's, I think, the point I, was, I think I'm trying to make here, is anytime there is, like, if you look at uh, any kind of a disaster or upheaval that happens, um, what that does, it reveals existing schisms and problems that are already there, makes those worse. Uh, and the other thing that it does, it takes trends which are already happening and pushes them faster. It, it is usually not that something brand new happens, but things that have, so if you look at, you know, people working remotely or the rise of online learning and the use of technology and learning. Um, so, so the two big things, you know, I think in hindsight, when we look back on this year, and I hope that we learn from both of them is this, that the most disadvantaged, just like, and I've said this before, the virus does not discriminate but its effect is felt differently because we do, because we as humans discriminate uh, against groups, against individuals, whatever the case may be. And that in hindsight that we look back on this year and we see this really as a year that we learned a lot. Uh, we learned about you know, human resilience and the you know, organizations which uh, were resilient. And we had lots of examples in this year in our shows of people and organizations who took this and they said, we will do the right thing. But there are also, as we all know, lots of organization institutions which did not take that challenge up, who did not. I think the other thing that we managed to do this year through our shows was identify, and this for me, I think has been the, the and this is where Zhao, I think you and I, I think started in a slightly different place but I think I'm sort of closer to where you are now, which is the power of those episodes where we had students and learners was palpable, right? I mean, those were, I think my personally, my favorite episodes. And I think that brings home to me the fact that we have to add always keep those learners and things at the center. We use those words, we use lip service on those words, uh, but it seems to me that that's something that we really have to make sure. What it has also added for me is this, my recent work has been around thinking about systems and, and, and culture and how do we design that. And very often when we reach that level of abstraction, we forget the learner. And I think that how we find the balance between these two perspectives, one is very bottom up, one is very top down, I think is the biggest challenge that we face as, as a field of education. And I just hope that this year allows us to 
learn those lessons and actually act on them. And if that is the case, then hindsight and 2020 will actually make sense with respect to this year, though in the act of living it, it did not make much sense at all. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you know what I mean. Well, so anyway, that was all that I wanted to share. That, that's, um, yeah. it, it struck me as something really um, important. It, it is the idea about 40 some weeks ago, we were talking about this. And also, I, I really, I think uh, maybe today we can reflect on the, the conflict uh, between the learner and the system, or maybe the compatibility of it. I, I don't know where, where that goes. But really, about what if the COVID stayed for more than a year? The original idea actually came from Shuang Ye. Uh, I was in Philadelphia. Shuang Ye was to, uh, as the executive editor of a journal, the ESA and your review of education. And she was looking for things maybe we should be writing about because China at that time was the country that was going through that. So I was just wondering, Shuang Ye, do you want to share a few things you've learned this year via the show, via the publication? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Yong. Actually, I was so impressed when you announced that this is the last show of uh, 2020. I didn't realize it. Um, you have already, uh, with uh, Chris, Kurt, and uh, Punya, took us so far. And you mentioned about the original idea, but I think the original idea is that I just mentioned a very small one. I mean, that is uh, if we were just uh, for several months, just in Chinese case, in China's case at that now, uh, and uh, at that them, um, what would happen? But uh, you are this kind of uh, venturous and also you, you have very wide imagination. You imagine that what if um, for one year, the whole universe, uh, the whole world will not, um, will not have the school, we have school closed. I think that's crazy. <laughs> and then, but now it turned to be true, and it's a kind of a sadly truth uh, reality. So I think that for the whole year, although I didn't um, attend the show or uh, all the time, sometimes I missed. It. I I was absent, uh, but I would have uh, stepped on the margin to observe this kind of a dialogues between uh, the scholars, the practitioners, students. And I was very impressed about this, uh, how this uh, uh, practitioners and the educational uh, thinkers, they could uh, still work on their local solutions and also their efforts uh, to make the system. I think the system, not only about this kind of uh, structured or formal systems running, but at least the people are doing what they can do during the pandemic and the disruption. Uh, this is the first thing I would like to share. Um, this is also like just uh, in uh, China, how would the, in the most serious uh, 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 situation of pandemic, how people from the different uh, parts, they still work together. Uh, and the second one is that uh, uh, how much, uh, I am not so sure about this kind of silver lining. I still think just as uh, Jean point out, this conflicts um, or kind of uh, conflict between learner and system. This is, could be a very unique opportunity for us to see the pandemic as kind of a natural experiment that we can find this kind of uh, cracks uh, uh, in the system because uh, this system is still kind of uh, uh, produced in the industrial uh, society. But now we have still got this kind of uh, uh, le its legacy and this, uh, how to say, mm, this is kind of, uh, they still lag behind uh, this, uh, the times, but we are happy to see the learners as Punya mentioned, the, the learners we invited, the students we invited here, they are already um, in the front of the system. How would the system could support them? Uh, so I think this is our mission and also our, uh, this is the meaning for us. Uh, to have this kind of a very 
uh, interesting shows every week lasting for 40 weeks uh, to have so diversified population related with uh, education here. And my last point is that I would like to point out um, in the basic education uh, field, not, in, not like in higher education field, in higher education field, I see a lot of people are talking about this kind of money consequences of this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, but in a basic education system still, uh, we are supported by this uh, public money and uh, uh, the public support uh, to make it uh, work. Um, However, seems like uh, people are still uh, not so aware about this kind of uh, human consequences of this uh, pandemic that is uh, on our system. I'm using the human um, consequences that is uh, from the Zygmunt Bauman's book, Human uh, Globalization, the Human Consequences. That is, in this uh, book, it's not only about talk about globalization, but it's also about this kind of uh, further device division of this human society uh, under globalization. But the, since this uh, pandemic, we will see how internet could int uh, connect us. However, make it as, this world as a more like a kind of a virtual world and the real world. The virtual world is still running quite well uh, with Zoom. Yeah, so we, we can see we are much busier than ever with uh, Zoom meetings, all kinds of meetings, but still facilitated by this kind of virtual platforms or other platforms. Mm, but well, we were not considered, there is a, uh, two worlds mentioned by this Zygmunt Bauman. That is the first world and the second world. The second world people, they live in time. The only uh, deficit for them is this, they will be uh, stay in time. And the second world, they were just tied in space. They, they will be killed by time. So I think this is also something we need to, uh, we can discuss more about how whether this kind of inequality uh, between uh, this, uh, the different students and how much the system could help um, this, uh, Fixing or not, a, I think fixing is more too ideal, uh, at least to um, do a bit of, a, to, to help a little bit more. Yeah, because the education system is not only about the learning, but it's also good to help uh, those from the disadvantaged. Uh, that's all uh, my sharing. Thank you, Shang Yi. Uh, they, um, I think they, um, the big message here is really the system has been stopped and the system has to be redesigned and has to be, we have to think about this. At the same time, we do see the prominence of new models of learning pods, you know, new possibility students doing their own work. By the way, I, I, I want to make sure that we remember Scott Turner. Scott was one of our, uh, you know, original uh, hosts and he's getting too busy. Uh, I Scott guess- Scott McLeod. What? Scott McLeod, not Turner. Oh, Scott, I'm sorry, it's not Scott, Scott McLeod. I forgot the name, you know. So I'm reading actually Scott's book right now. He just has a new manuscript coming out. And it's a fabulous book about new schools and new designs and all these innovative schools they visited. And so I, I was just wondering, um, Chris, I want to bring you on. I'll leave Kurt to do the last one. Uh, and Chris, what's your reflection, you know? Before well, you I, mentioned Chris there, you forgot to say, we're going to hear from the voice of God. Oh, okay. Yes. He's, he's voice only today. Just voice. <laughs> um, I'd, I'd really like to divide mine into two parts and talk now about looking back and then maybe, maybe later we can all talk about looking forward. So looking back, I, I think one thing I learned is that I thought that I knew pretty much what was happening in ed tech worldwide, but I was only seeing the tip of the iceberg. There have been so many things that in episodes that really nobody knew about. 
except the people doing it and, and the people who directly benefited. So many things going on all across the world. And we, we wring our hands about the fact that ed tech is not as pervasive as it should be, which is true. But I think we underestimate also how pervasive it's becoming and, and who are the champions of ed tech. And I think one of the things I'm proudest of about this program is that we are highlighting people that nobody has heard of, as well as people that are well known, places that nobody has heard of, as well as the usual suspects that we talk about when we talk about ed tech. And that's very exciting. It's very exciting to find out about all that iceberg below the water. The second thing that I've been thinking about is that the episodes that we've been most excited about, we've been excited about because of people, not because of technology. So it's not as if the episodes that have meant the most are the ones with the most advanced technology. Now I like advanced technology and I believe that it has a lot of benefits and that we should move in that direction. But some of the episodes are using mature technology, simple technology, and yet the people have done so much with it that it just underscores again that the technology is not the innovation. Technology is the catalyst. The people and their ideas about learning are the innovation. But the third thing that I find myself thinking about, and then I'll stop, that's the looking back part, is which people? Because I think that every organization has found that some people stepped up and some people were paralyzed by this disruption. And if you had asked in advance, who are the people who are gonna step up and who are the people who are gonna be paralyzed I think that very few people would have gotten that list right. Because it isn't that the people with more skills were the ones who stepped up. It isn't that the people who had more of a leadership position were necessarily the ones who stepped up. And, and so I think it comes down to disposition. And I've been thinking a lot about the disposition of hardiness, which involves Self-efficacy, a belief that you can make a difference. Commitment, that you want to make a difference. And then, you know, the capacity to, to act and make a difference. And I, I think we underestimate dispositions. And maybe that's one of the reasons that we don't see as much ed tech implementation as we would like. We think, well, they just need more skills. They just need more skills. They just need more skills. Well, maybe at some point they need instead that when it gets difficult to implement, they just keep going anyway. So looking back, I feel as if I see the world through somewhat different lenses than I did before all of this happened. And a big factor in those different lenses has been the stories and the episodes. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, I was just wondering, I think it, it was you that who said this early on, is that um, what technology has done is problem. If we don't, it's problem that we don't re realize it. If the pandemic took place or had taken place 10 years ago, uh, I don't know what education would have been like 10 years ago or 15 years ago. We could have had a very different kind of education. I don't know how remote learning could have been run, online education. So that is, um, Kurt, you've been writing about open education. Can I just so make a all quick this comment? What, what do you think? Punya, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment on something Chris said and then Kurt on to you. I think, Kurt, the, Chris, the point you made about disposition that thing is really important but one of the things that i've been thinking a lot about because of some work that we're doing here which has sort of changed my way of thinking about a little bit 
is is sort of a core sort of values that you bring to the work that you do. And I think that those who of people who so I think that even underlies the dispositions that if you are thinking that you have you have reach that your job is to reach out to even the most disadvantaged or the most difficult to reach if that's sort of your core value you will do that work irrespective of what the situation may be so i think there has to be some discussion within our uh, sort of the field of education about sort of what are the values that we are bringing to the table are we meeting the needs of some legal meeting which is that everybody needs to get x or y the same or are we meeting the goals of individual learners what are the values and principles that we bring to that i think that's a discussion we often don't have that's a discussion in education we have left to outside people outside within the political system who you know that's how we sort of try not to encroach in that space but i think that's another important piece that emerged for me is how driven each of these people were by sort of the commitment to the learner which is a value laden judgment right at the end of the day and i think that that was something that stood out for me so thank you for making that point and allowing me to sort of add to that a little bit kurt so i'll make that point number 10 because i've got nine points and i just want to comment on what chris has said first hardiness and that means when people fall down, they get back up. So not only is he thinking about the concept, he's living the concept. He tried it out today by falling down and he's get, gotten back up to help us out in the show. So he's a hardy guy. And it's, it's a joy to work with all of you hardy people that have each of the people on the show, each of the co-hosts have made their dent in their own respective ways, multiple dents. And, uh, and so it's a joy for me to join them and hear what, what they've been doing, what they will do, or what they are doing. Uh, another H word is happy holidays to everybody watching 40th episode. Um, Merve's on the other side of this uh, in, in YouTube. This is the holiday tie she got for me. So thank you there. The other H word is hair. I have not cut my hair since before the first episode. So uh, it's been March 11, about 42 weeks or so. Uh, and the last H word, hooray. Hooray to us, hooray to our followers, our viewers, uh, people who use these videos, who will use these videos in their classes in the spring. Um, you know, a big round of applause to, and especially to Young and to shang -E, who really designed the idea. Uh, Chris and Punya and I and Scott just happened to march along and with, their order, with their marching orders that they gave. No, we gladly joined in. Um, and so the, so the first point I wanna make is um, that, that we've done more than we, proposed than we expected, or we've seen more things and heard from more people than we could have imagined during that first week that we met with back in spring break in March. So um, that's the first point I wanna make. The second thing is immediately we became aware of resources of the guests that we brought in, of our resources. And these are, these are the handouts from the last couple of weeks shows that I've been printing out every week. And so there's a tremendous wealth of resources and tools and um, guidelines that our guests have provided to the global community or their local community. So I think the show has found a way to expose people to the resources beyond what, what they're aware of, what they're normally uh, reading and following and so forth has expanded them. And I think that's, a, that's, a, that's an important aspect of this show. And if you listen to, other podcasts or other webcast shows, you know, on NPR and other places, it is about exposure and expanding people beyond what they're thinking about. And so I, I think we're kind of kind of like an NPR show, you know, this is. Um, and the third thing um, is that we all talk about our networks and we each have our networks as we, we've seen over the 40 episodes, but we've just barely tapped into them. You know, there's a lot more that we that we could do and, and um, and we might have to go back and personally, each of us revisit what our respective networks are when we start thinking about 2021 and what possible shows and what possible activities that we might have. But uh, we have global networks and it's appeared, it's, it's, it's apparent on our weekly shows that, that it is a global in nature and that's exciting. Um, and I'm ex excited to be exposed to the people that you've worked with or wanna work with and brought in just because you've wanted to hear from them. Uh, I think the fifth thing, uh, I'm going through my list here, that was number three. The, the fourth thing is people aren't saying no, people are coming. 
we ask, you know, pretty much they're, they're excited to come in and to talk about what they've been up to and uh, be part of this show and then promote it. I mean, I sent some of this on GM Mishra at Commonwealth of Learning about an hour beforehand and immediately he's off promoting, you know, what's, what's happening here. So the, with each show, the network expands. And also we have people who are coming to us like John asking us about doing other shows for Ireland or for whatever. So we're starting to expand that way that we didn't really plan on. We didn't, I don't think we thought about other people coming to see, see us. Um, I think the, la the, the last four kind of wrapped together and that is, uh, Shang-Yi talked about balance, balance between uh, practitioners and scholars, she said. But I think it's beyond that, practitioner and scholars. We've had people who I would call doers like Stephen Heppel, who is a fascinating guy and showing us the products that he's designed and that I never would have dreamed of. And, um, you know, and we haven't really reflected on that. I think that show in particular was exciting in many ways. Um, but we have had researchers, we've had students, we've had leaders in um, schools, leaders in university settings, you know, ISTE leaders, the, the, the gentleman from, from Australia. Um, so I think thinking about that balance. We've done a pretty good job of having a, a variety of folks in for the balance, but we also have to think about balance in terms of number. I'm finding that the best shows are the ones that have three people or one person, but um, two people's okay and, and four is okay, four is good. Five's getting to be a bit too much, but possible. Don't go beyond five as Chris pointed out, um, but probably three is a good size because we can, uh, we can hear from different people and their perspectives and tap into different things that other people in the group might think about. But, you know, and so I, but one person, if they've done a lot, is also in a very enlightening kind of show as well. So one in three, I say. And then we have to think about time. We have to think about balance of time for people in, in Asia or in Australia, New Zealand. This time works well for us, but you know, we've changed time but that causes a problem with our audience not being aware. I've not been good at announcing the time for the next show. That's my, I've, done, I've messed up three, at least two times, maybe three times. Um, and then um, we got to think about geography and we've done a pretty good job about that uh, in terms of balance. We've had people geographically all around the world. We do, you know, so in terms of time, geography, expertise, role in, in, in the community, we've done pretty good. So now you ask about open education. I think this COVID crisis has caused many teachers and administrators and students to, to appreciate the fact that there is a, a lot of open education out there uh, and they've become aware of it. I mean, they're not gonna be users of open ed unless they're aware of it. So COVID has caused awareness to happen. Then comes resistance after awareness and then comes doing and understanding what, to, what how to use it. And then comes advocacy and sharing. You know, they were stuck in the, in the awareness, 60% of faculty in higher ed wasn't, weren't even aware of what open education is, okay, and in, 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 in studies being done by um, Sloan Foundation and others. Um, so I think open education, the door has been opened. Um, and I could go on and talk more about it, uh, but I've, I've talked long enough, we should probably, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Kurt. So, so I'm actually going to do well, I've, I've, I think I'm gonna pose a question <clears throat> for the audience. I wanna summarize a, a few things. I think first of all, given what all of you guys said, we couldn't believe or we can't believe that we've, uh, we've done this. We've done this for 40 episodes. Uh, when we started, we didn't plan for this. And then uh, as I think Kurt, you were saying, the more we, we try, the more we, people we reach. We have a growing network of people. We have a lot of people watching us in different formats. So this is a very different show. You know, it, it is not like a, trying to drive like a football game, you know, but it is, it is a um, interesting, diverse uh, conversation about different people. Uh, I don't know if people may not know this. Actually, Punia is from India. I was from China. Strong is from China. If you put the population together of the, the host, that's quite large already. And we've had uh, a great representation of the global south, which uh, can, you know, typically is, uh, is uh, ignored. The second thing I think we have, um, we have touched some 
significant educational issues, not only on educational technology, but really on educational issues. And one of them really is, as I was you know, uh, chatting with Pune just now, the conflict and compatibility of system and individual students. Uh, I think the, what Kurt was saying and what Chris was saying, disposition or hardiness, is that I hope when pandemic retreats, maybe during next summer or maybe at the end of next year, that we do not forget the power of uh, openness of global connection. I'm honestly, you know, one thing I feel bad is that when I see schools return, like in China, others, they forgot about that. So they have gone a little bit open, but they didn't go open enough. You know, the teachers were looking for resources randomly, they put everything together, they're accessing from the cloud. But when they could, you know, I was doing a presentation for a system, I said, teachers is connecting globally, but why don't you make your students connecting globally? You know, we had the Global Learning Online Academy, they did, you know, they were doing something interesting. So I'm hoping that, you know, our show will help schools to rethink about free the students in the open. What if the students learning kind of context becomes open so they can redraw, students can become owners of their own learning each student can construct their own school for themselves. Punya, that's what uh, you and I need to write this book. They can, they can create their own micro school by combining many schools. That's actually what my hope would be and which we will be talking a lot about in the future. And uh, a third point, which is a disappointing one. We, we see so many schools, so many innovators featured on our show. But at the same time, if you look in the media, People are still talking about return to school. Schools return to normal, which means once we return to normal, the online learning piece will be cut, the open learning will be cut, will we'll lock back our students in the classrooms. Because a lot of times people are talking about the learning loss. I've been reading a lot of learning loss reports. I think they are not very helpful because I'm talking loss in math and reading. It's likely governments may launch testing of math and reading, highlighting those subjects, or they may invest in how do you make up for the loss? You know, the loss is huge, not only in reading and math, but in many other areas. So I hope our show in the future can drive some kind of policy discussions. You know, that, that's what. So what I would like to invite anyone to comment on. Say, on young, this, young, before you... you uh, you and Punya went to grad school together, right? Yes. At, at Illinois. You yes. and Punya worked at Michigan State together. Yes, now we're and, apart. And, and, and you still like each other. You know, yeah, so yeah. I want to clarify that, you know. Yes. Yeah. So you're going to work on a book together. Well, that's great. If that's one outcome that has come from the show, no, that would no. be a wonderful we've outcome. We've been working on with each other on many things together, on books. We, we did, you know, we would just work on this. But Punya, go ahead. You still like me, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I just want to make one point to this idea of like individuals like designing their own schools. And I think this was a conversation that we had up after the episode from Nepal. So thanks Kurt for organizing that. So a couple of things to sort of learn from that episode that, that really struck home to me and Young and I think you and I talked about it. So one was that these kids started with learning English. And then we got these two examples, one uh, who wanted, who got interested in astrophysics right, and astronomy and cosmology, another one who got interested in medieval history and fiction. And we're now crafting their own curriculum. And I think that was, to me, was a very powerful example of the point Zhao was making. But I think hidden under that were the systems which allowed for these open courses and these MOOCs to exist in the first place. They don't just happen. And I think that when we talk about individuals as learners, we have to understand that there was Stanford and edX or whoever were creating these things. There was people's time, effort, money involved in making these things available. And I think that there is sort of this disconnect between what, you know, what students can do and what, what goes into making these, these systems, which allow for them to access that information, that knowledge, 
and take those classes or whatever it may be, right? And I think that to me is the space where, as is a space for design, it's a space for policy, it's a space for further discussion because that is the way. I mean, so if you think about sort of the open uh, classroom stuff that you know the Kurt you talk about, uh, those are targeted predominantly at teachers and educators. You know, and we haven't developed those systems directly for students. And I think that's a really powerful step, which will sort of make this Zhao's idea of every child designing their own school a reality is if we think of what are the systems that can scaffold that kind of work. You know, because it's not just taking one astronomy course, it is thinking about a program of study which will spread over years and saying, you need to now go and learn differential and integral calculus or tensor calculus if you really want to understand how gravitational waves work. I mean, it's, 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 and we, I don't think we have the systems to do that. We have the systems in place now for somebody to get a nibble of an idea and say, oh, this is cool, this is interesting. But how do we scaffold that into uh, 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 a life, lifelong sort of uh, an experience of learning. And I think, uh, Chris, you can speak to some of the work you've been doing around this sort of lifelong learning and 60 year curriculum and stuff like that. But I think that's where I think it's really interesting. Well, let me Ponya, jump back. Ponya, first, yeah. I, think I want to invite uh, uh, you guys to jump in. This is actually an interesting topic. You know, I've been one of my doc students at Michigan State University many years ago, because I've been really interested in, at that time I call it a personalized learning ecosystem. It's because if you look at every one of us actually construct our own learning ecosystem. You know, when you go to university, there are courses you take, courses you don't take, courses you ignore, courses you pretend. So in many ways you are reconstructing, but you are absolutely right, Punya, that is, uh, you know, we have to have this resource available. You know, without them, you cannot do it. You know, it's a, uh, you know, and, and you know, of course you can always reconstruct when you go to a library, you had a library, you can do it. I think that the, the, the key, what we will be discussing, I think uh, our audience, a lot of them are into student ownership, student personalization, project-based learning. Because I think one point you made, I, want, I really want to emphasize right now in most books published, are for teachers to teach the existing subject better or for school leaders to run their schools better within the system, but not against the system. So what, what I'm really interested in is to say, how do we empower students to go to chip away something about the system, use a with or without technology? You know? so, so that's you know, where, where kind of the interesting things can be. Uh, Kurt, I saw you, you were on, and uh, Chris, um, Trangye, feel free to jump in. Chris, go ahead. Chris? I didn't have anything in particular at this point. Um, either anybody else? Okay. I was just going to pose a question to Punya, given the, the Young's concern that we're just going to have more testing. What kind of initiatives would you like to see from the government uh, granted uh, calls that would address the issue of the students creating and scaffolding their own curriculum through open educational resources? So if you think about like when you, when we think, I mean, the two things, like when we go to school or when we go to university, what is it that we are getting there? If you think about that, you know, there's this whole Chris Rock routine about like when he used to peel potatoes and there was the other guy standing peeling potatoes. He said the difference between the other guy and me that he saw that as a career, I saw that as a job. So in some ways, the role of educational institutions is to open the world out to our students so that they can see potential careers. They can see potential futures for themselves. When a student is by themselves learning and you know, if they don't have that pathway mapped out clearly. And I think that's what schools do, whether they do it well or badly is not what I'm talking about. But when I, you know, when I was in my, like when I was in high school, everybody's like, oh, you're good at science and math, you should do engineering. Okay, there I went. And then my four years were mapped out for, for, for me. I did a bunch of stuff that people had predetermined was what I needed to do. I got a rubber stamp on a piece of paper. And then I was like, screw this, I'm gonna go and do design. I was lucky that I had that opportunity. Many people don't. 
So I think the question that is, if children or student learners have to determine their own learning, how do we scaffold for them a system that is not restrictive the way schools and universities are today? that still has that openness and flexibility that allows them to explore. But if they choose to go deep in one direction, I mean, even if you think about the students who came to our program, you know, the girl from Hawaii and so on, they had structures that allowed them to take their passion and go deep into it. So that's what I mean when I say, we need to design systems that allow for students to choose and go deep or to step back, go in another direction. Ideally, that's what a liberal education is. Ideally, that's what universities should do, but they don't function that way often. Well, that's, what, think that's uh, what I think is the interesting thing. I think Chris has a comment to make because I saw him. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, well, I, I think one of the interesting things about this program is that we alternate between talking about perennial issues and then issues that are very specific to the pandemic. And I wanna say just a couple things looking forward about issues specific to the pandemic. One of them is um, there, there are gonna be huge economic problems for a while. There are gonna be a lot of people unemployed who, who never thought they would be unemployed and, and who probably will never go back to the job that they were used to. And that's a terrible tragedy but we also have to ask, where's the opportunity? Now in the US, in the Great Depression, um, the opportunity that the president saw, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was public works programs. And so the government went into debt to hire people who were now available and put them to work creating infrastructure. And that infrastructure paid off big time. I think that there's a lot of people now, if there were a comparable public works program, that it could be about human infrastructure rather than being about physical infrastructure. That there could be a lot of people who, at least as an interim measure, became involved with helping other people to learn and were subsidized by the federal government to do that. Now, by to learn, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying academic learning, um, but, but to learn things that are useful and powerful in life. And I think that, that we need to, to ask, what can we do to help people who are going to be underemployed or unemployed and who at the same time have valuable knowledge that they could transmit to others. The other looking forward point I wanted to make is, um, I know that, that Harvard, at least parts of Harvard, are locked in next year to doing simultaneous face-to-face -face and online teaching. There's gonna be courses where that's how it happens. And I think that that's true of a lot of other places as well, including places that don't yet realize that that's going to be what happens. I think that's much harder than either online only or face-to-face -face only. And, and I think we're gonna need some new models of, of thinking about that because we can use technology to try to have online students feel some of the social presence that face-to-face -face students feel. And we can use asynchronous technology to help face-to-face -face students and online students have similar experiences some of the time. But I, I think it's gonna take more than that to really make this work. And one of the themes that we might think about this in 2021 would be looking at people who were, who were doing both at the same time, which is high flex is part of it, but high flex is kind of one or the other. And I'm really talking about both. So those are just a couple pandemic specific reflections that I think might characterize a lot of what we face in 2021.
Well, Chris, I, I think uh, what you described in what happened in the crisis also deals with the perennial issues too. So in many ways, you know, how do we, I, that's what I, I look at this as opportunity to rethink education. So I think that the description, for example, a description of uh, so many schools, so many teachers gone online or closed their physical schools, some of them created more kind of experiential learning. A lot of students do more projects, some of them, you know, because they are lazy or whatever, you know, whatever they're doing. So that, that enabled that possibility. Uh, and just as a side note, uh, Chris, when you talk about economic downturn, I was reading somewhere said, maybe this is the best time to try universal basic income. Maybe Andrew Yang was right. Government should give free money to people when they have no jobs. And, uh, you know, when we have about 44, I was reading some uh, prediction, 44% uh, of businesses uh, in the developed world will be going online, you know, will be doing business online from different places. So people are talking about housing in San Francisco, you know, downtown area in, in, in so all of those massive changes. But one point I, I want to bring to all of us, we got our, another really 15 minutes uh, or so, is for us to think about next year, you know, what kind of shows do we want? Because early on, we had shows about how are people dealing with the COVID? What are they doing? We had people from Italy, Israel, you know, different countries. Then we always had shows about uh, people doing technology innovations. They're doing that, you know, all, all those things. Then recently we had shows about individuals who've done amazing things in environmental education. And next year, you know, we, we are, we, we plan to do more of those things. So I want to hear from each and every one of you, what what kind of emphasis we might be focused on, what interest we might do. Kurt, go for it. So I'm going to just make a comment on what Chris has said um, in his first comment. Um, I felt like Chris was planning his, his acceptance speech for Department of Ed secretary. Uh, and, and, and I hope he gets contacted by Biden pretty soon. Uh, he'll be able to work with Pete Buttigieg and create that infrastructure. But, uh, but in a comment on, on Punya's point, um, I think the Nepal episode was good from the standpoint of showing us self-directed learners. Um, but what I've been trying to do is look at what are ways that you can re scaffold, as Punya's pointing out, the, the MOOCs, because MOOCs have been very drill and kill for the most, as Chris has pointed out before, the dropout rates, all it's got huge problems. But we had the MOOCs for our cause, kids doing environmental cleanup, and we had the kids in Nepal doing you know, self-study of English and their parents being impressed with their getting certificates and blah, blah, blah. But what are, the way, what are things that instructional designers, people were training and others can embed in them to foster an army, a global army of self-directed learners uh, and, 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 and change our perceptions of the possibilities of MOOCs and other non-traditional forms of learning, uh, alternative forms of learning, so that people can tap into this rich store of open and open educational resources. And they've been less and less open over time as the corporates have taken over. I understand that. But uh, you know, I think uh, what I want to maybe answer my own question, Punya, that I posed to you is that, I think one thing the federal government needs to fo focus on is the lifelong learning, self-directed learning, informal learning skills, and not just the reifying testing, testing, testing over and over. So I, I'm going to I'm, I'm not I'm going to cede to Shangye because she hasn't talked for a while, and I'm going to think about what future shows that we might want to have. Since Shangye really had the idea first, I think she needs to comment first. Thank you, thank you, Kurt. Um, actually. Um, yeah, I thought uh, would as uh, Jean and uh, um, mentioned about this kind of uh, more wider uh, or more crazy uh, thinking about uh, constructing a new uh, learning system rather than the traditional schooling system. Would there be possible that we can include more people um, around education, but not in the existing system? Uh, for like if they were just like uh, Kurt mentioned uh, that it is in other alternative form or the non-traditional uh, uh, form uh, or just how, how can we leverage this kind of um, 
the global army around the existing existing system. Um, yeah, I think that would be kind of uh, even in where they were in business or uh, kind of uh, other uh, uh, lines of works, would there be also beneficial to our discussion, not only from uh, not only the people from our existing system? Yeah. I was just wondering, uh, uh, Chris or Punia, uh, do you have um, anything that you wish we would do next year? I'm really curious about where we want to focus because I think uh, I don't know. I don't think vaccination is going to cover the world next year entirely. Right. You know, I, I, so I want to uh, build on something that Chris said. Um, Chris, do you want to go ahead? I, I feel bad that you're just because no, your you face go is ahead. Not Please go okay. ahead. Okay, thank you. Because I feel like just because you know you are like a freeze frame on our Zoom screen that we tend to, you know, ignore you, which is terrible. Um, so I'm trying to just keep track of the little icon which says you have uh, unmuted yourself. Um, I think what Chris said, you know, that we have had two kinds of programs. You know, one we have had which are around more enduring issues around education, and others. Uh, which are more sort of COVID related. I think our shift in the upcoming months need to be towards more of the former. I think thinking about, you know, getting a little bit more systematic about, I mean, maybe it comes out of uh, Scott McLeod's book about examples of schools who have already been doing something interesting, because I think there are some lot of positive stories that we can tell. And and that's what I want to come back to, again, something that Chris said earlier, which is which were the organizations or individuals who powered through, who showed that resilience or that hardiness or had some core values. Um, and I think that and our experience here with the school that we had helped design um, in a local school district was exactly that, that a school which foundationally believed in relationships, believed in student agency and teacher agency, responded to the crisis very differently from the rest of the district. In fact, they, had, they pushed back against the district and said, we cannot do what you guys are suggesting because it goes against our fundamental values. It goes against issues of equity and they got the freedom to do that. And so I think in the upcoming year, it might be great to be looking at organizations like that or people like that or systems like that. Speak of that, Punia, uh, I just had someone, you know, someone, Chris, you may know, um, contact me. He, uh, he, 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 he got his degree from Harvard and worked uh, for the World Bank and founded a, a principal of a school in Washington, D.C. And just recently, he just uh, uh, got out of the job of the principal of the John Dewey School at the University of Chicago. And he's asked me to work with him on something that, uh, about 10 very promising or innovative school principles. And I said, why don't you bring them on to our show? I will make, we'll make you a special guest as, as that. I think that's a very powerful message, but of course we need to uh, uh, decide if these are truly innovative. And also I think we should uh, um, ask and invite Scott McLeod back because the book he has is quite powerful. They got 30 schools in various parts, mostly in the, in the US, they have, you know, schools, you know, it's really innovative schools about student-centered. I think that's a very, very good message. And, uh, and of course, you know, we, we're a bunch of ed tech people. We need to have a ed tech focus in, in some aspects of that as well. I think, I think we need to have um, a show on high school say completion rates. Chris wanted to say something. Yeah, Chris, I'm sorry. No, I, I think one of the fun shows that I, I remember is when we talked about if we had a billion dollars, what would we spend it on to a change education? And I think it would be fun to playfully um, do some of that as well. That could be a question we ask every guest. <laughs> Last question, you know. What would you do with your billion dollars? Uh, billion bonker bills, I, as I call them. Uh, I think we need more shows on community college level yeah, and, and also in workplace learning, something in workplace-based learning, you know, adult learning, um, you know, adults in the workforce. Maybe we get somebody who's a training development person or chief learning officer 
or so forth. Um, it might be interesting to hear from those so, folks. And uh, also, finishing high school, a lot of kids dropping out, and how 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 is uh, how is open education used? How are you know online courses used? What what kind of innovations are happening there? Go ahead. So uh, no, I mean we have uh, the episode from India coming up on the twenty third, where we have uh, two people, one who runs an innovative school. Uh, trained in design and then designed the school. Um, and then uh, the other person actually works in this transition from uh, school to work. And, you know, uh, sort of not fully adult as in like, you know, but that intermediary space. So I think that'll be exciting. From here, I was wondering what's your view? What, what, what do you, would you like to uh, bring more uh, people um, in your domain? You know, you're, you're researching curriculum and you're researching leadership. And what do you think? Um, but as um, I, I wonder that just as you mentioned, most of the books on the curriculum and the leadership, they were just consider how to get the better <laughs> betterment of the existing system rather than to disruptive. Yeah, um, because usually people in those fields are uh, less comfortable with uh, the disruptions. Yeah. So I think that's, uh, uh, but if I would just suggest maybe, would there be possible we can have uh, several uh, sessions uh, with a historian or policy um, researcher? Yeah, historian sometimes um, will be <laughs> very interesting, especially educational historian. Now, what would they comment on this kind of um, that would be uh, very good. Uh, Puni has been arguing for historians, writers, uh, poets, uh, philosophers, physicists, you know. Uh, yeah, I think we wanted some different perspectives, definitely uh, make recommendations. It's, uh, and, and I'm actually very interested in uh, the, the idea of driving uh, up from the bottom, but also um, I'm actually curious about, um, maybe Chris, you can bring some more, more people some of the most advanced technologies in education, that's leading. I think we have not done that, you know, that may or may not have a bright future, but just wanna say, what, what are people experimenting on those things? Chris? Happy to do that. Happy to have some episodes like that. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful, you know. Uh, that, so last minute, any other things you wanna say? Have everyone say, uh, uh, a few sentences about the new year. And uh, before you do that, because I want to say, um, we will not have shows for two weeks and we will start again at 5.30 to 6.30 Eastern time on the 9th, on, uh, on January 9th. And our guest will be Gabriel from Argentina. Gabriel used to be the principal of uh, the oldest bilingual school in Argentina. He's been author of several technology books. He's co-authored with me. Now he's uh, running a brand new, and uh, not new, actually, he bought a school to run, and he also has a consulting firm. He writes a lot. So Gabriel will be among the first, uh, you know, our shows to talk about from a basic education level, K-12, how to do personalized learning, project-based learning, with technology. So that's January the 9th. So I want to invite everyone to say a few words to our audience, given the holiday season. I will start with that. I will say, happy holidays. Thanks for being with us. We'll do the show better next year. Kurt. I want to just extend a young, what he said, he's going to bring someone in from Argentina. We'll go a little further south the week after and have someone from Antarctica studying penguins, Gene Pennycook, as we mentioned last time. So on the 16th, we'll have Gene, who's been studying penguins for 15 years and working with 300 schools. Um, I want to say everyone, I wish everyone new learning adventures that are fun in 2021. Strong year. Um, yeah, thank you for following us for 40 weeks. And uh, the most credit should go to uh, Young, Kurt, Puni, and Chris, and uh, uh, Scott. And I was um, uh, absent for several sessions, but uh, uh, Young, Kurt, Puni, and Chris deserve two weeks break. <laughs> and uh, happy holidays. And we wish the, in the uh, 2021, there will be less pains and uh, more happiness. Yeah. Ponia. 
Um, you know, the pandemic is not done yet. Uh, the vaccines are here, but the worst of it, at least in the United States, is still to come, I think. Um, so I just wish everybody, um, all of the guests who have had over the years, over the year, over the months, all of you, the hosts, and all of uh, the people who are watching that stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, 2021 will be a different year. It'll have its own challenges. And for whatever it may be, it has been, a, uh, this has been a year of disruption and not knowing what the next week is gonna look like. But I knew there was one constant. And the constant was on Saturdays, we would meet together and we would, um, as educators, as friends, as human beings uh, with a commitment to education and learning, spend this time together. It has been deeply meaningful uh, for me personally. So I want to thank all of you on the screen in front of me, all of the guests for, you know, and, and, and the people who are following online uh, for being part of this for 40 weeks. That's, that's a long time. And I just wish all the very best uh, for everybody and stay safe, be good. And as Kurt said, keep learning. Chris, you're the last. You have the last word on this show today in this year. Well, holidays are about families and communities. And it's shared support that gets all of us through these very difficult times. And I hope that despite the limits of virtual, that we've been able to be a part of your community this year. And You've certainly been a part of mine, and I'm excited. I'm excited about the next year and deepening and broadening this community. So, happy holidays.